Hello and welcome to Keep Right on a Birmingham City podcast uh, brought from us here at Birmingham Live to all Birmingham City fans. I'm Brian Dick and I'm joined by our Blues reporter, Alex Dickin, um, who for once will be feeling slightly refreshed that there's not been a major announcement today. Uh, it, it has been 24 hours since since the last one, so that's good news. Alex, welcome and how are you doing? Yeah, good, thank you. Um, I guess we might as well get straight into it. We're going to come on to Gary Wright press conference from yesterday and uh, another first manager press conference this season. That's the uh, the fourth, is it? Fourth, yeah, fourth. Yeah, I suppose if you include John Eustace and two interims as well, so six different managers in press conferences this season. Uh, been a crazy old season, but yeah, as you said, nothing in the last 24 hours to uh, to get our teeth stuck into apart from that Gary Wright press conference. And um, yeah. yeah, very. I was, I was quite impressed with him. I'll, uh, I'll yeah. say that. Yeah, indeed. Gary Rowett's um, first press conference, f- f- second first press conference, because obviously when he first came to the club, and I think it was October 2014, um, he did a press conference. And uh, when I, I think he was asked by my predecessor, Colin Tasson, whether he was mad or had a death wish or something like that, because Blues had just come off off the back of an, an 8-0 defeat to, to Bournemouth. He was, he was bright-eyed, but exuded confidence back then. Um, and I would say from my observations, and, and you were obviously in the room at the time yesterday, seems remarkably confident, very comfortable in that chair, isn't he? Yeah, he's looked as comfortable as any of the, the other five people who've sat in that chair this season have looked um, more than more comfortable than most of them. Um, yeah, he's clearly a manager. He's, you know, he's done 10 years in the Championship now, hasn't he? Not his first relegation rodeo either. So, um, ooze confidence throughout, clearly he has a plan. Didn't divulge too many details of that plan as we'd expect, but I think we can all presume, you know, and look into how Blues are going to play over these next eight games. I think it'll look a lot different to what it would have in the previous, you know, 10 or whatever under Mark Venus and Tony Mowbray, I think, and even Wayne Rooney before that as well. I think they'll play probably a little bit more pragmatic. Um, but yeah, he, I mean, at times he was, you know, leaning back in his chair, feet stretched out in front of him, looked very, very relaxed. Uh, and uh, clear in his messages to us. So you can imagine that's also being transmitted to the players in that way. Even invoking a a, a famous away day uh, over which he in which he was in charge, which when Blues went to, to Fulham and won 5-2, uh, notable for goals for Viv Solomon Otterbaugh. Uh, one of my favourite pictures that, that, that's been taken in the last decade was Viv celebrating against this, this backdrop of... Of, of light camera bulbs and phones flashing and everything really e- evocative picture that and also memorable for me for the only time that Jonathan Grounds ever agreed to do an interview with me um not one naturally drawn to the press and he was a really good talker I've, I've got to say I, re- I really they always this. are they always are the ones who don't want to speak <laughs> yeah he, he, he was he was he, he had a good insight he was warm he was friendly and then for the other nine years he looked at me as oh, I was something on his shoe, but there we go. Um, yeah, so obviously a, a, a 5-2 victory in the capital would go down very nicely tomorrow, wouldn't it? Um, yeah. uh, even a point would go down nice, nicely tomorrow. The other thing that struck out stuck out to me, Alex, was his, the t- he's clearly spoken to Tony Mowbray. Can you give us yeah. some insight into, into Mowbray's role in finding... The, the the right man to take over for eight games. Yeah, I think Mowbray, from what Rao was saying, Mowbray is looking at this as uh, Gary Rao being a firefighter for eight games, coming in, doing whatever it takes to get Blues over the line, and the rebuild, the reset button can be hit in the summer. Um, Rao made it clear that you know he wanted to speak to Tony Mowbray before he agreed to accept the role, um, in the knowledge that Mowbray had been part of the. Uh, the, the group who identified him as a potential candidate to come in and, and do this job. And Rout said that Mowbray basically first up on the phone said to him, um, do it your own way. You know, don't worry about what's gone before. Don't worry about how I've tried to to implement a style of play with this team, this group of players. Just do it your own way and, and do what you see fit. And um, I think that's that's what Rout has to do because ultimately, you know, the next eight games, what happens after it probably won't affect Gary Rout a great deal, you know. But, you know, he is in control of these eight games and he's in control of, of Blue's destiny, really, isn't he? So he has got to do what he sees fit. He has got to put out the 11 players that he thinks can get the result in each of these eight games. 
Um, there's no point, no point having that. There's obviously, you know, there's a need for communication between him and Tony Mowbray at times if Gary Rowett needs it, but it's not going to be like a, a Mark Venus was his interim where Tony Mowbray is in the background pulling the strings and guiding him. This is going to be Gary Rowett's team selection, Gary Rowett's tactics. And, you know, if Blues win, it's going to be down to Gary Rowett, isn't it, I suppose, as well? Yeah, there's no point him picking a shadow Tony Mowbray team or, you know, the side that Mowbray would pick and, and, and him then, him then trying to organize. Basically the, the, the thing that leapt out for me in his, in that was, he said, my job is to make sure Tony Mowbray is a championship manager when he comes back in the summer. And that, that is absolutely it in a nutshell. And he also made, I think you asked him about the coaching structure, didn't you? Now, obviously he's brought in, um, Paul Robinson, Joe Carnell has, has come as well, um, and Ashley okay. Cole, Pete Shuttleworth, and Mike Taylor remain from the previous regime. So, wh- how's this been sliced up? Do you think? Yeah, Dave Carolan too. Um, yeah, so, so Joe Carnell, as you mentioned there, he's probably the most interesting thing really because he's he's been part of Blues recruitment team for the last twelve months, um, having previously worked with Gary Rowett at you know, at Blues first, but then also at Derby County at Stoke, where he worked mainly as an analyst before going to Millwall and joining the coach and set up as a technical coach. Um, So I think one of the first things that we both noticed from that Gary Rout first training session video that Birmingham City put out last week was that Joe Carnell was on the sidelines next to him. You know, I've, I've been to the training ground God knows how many times in the last 12 months and I haven't seen Joe Carnell there. So obviously his business does normally lie away from the training ground, but yeah, very much on the training ground, front and centre, next to Gary Rauer. And I asked Gary Rauer about his involvement at the press conference, and he said basically, you know, he knows him really well. They've lived together for three years while they were both working in London for Millwall. Um, they were flatmates, um, and he trusts him. Obviously, implicitly, Joe Carnell knows the way Gary Rauer works, knows the way he wants to play, and knows the way- messages that he wants to impart. So, in these eight games, Rowett can't really afford to have any kind of teething issues or, you know, trial games, can he? It's got to be straight in with the correct messages and obviously he wants people around him that he can trust. And in Joe Carnell, he's got a person who's already at Blues that he knows well and has obviously brought him into that coaching setup. So I'd probably expect to see him on the bench in these next eight games alongside Gary Rowett, alongside Paul Robinson and Dave Carolan. With the others, it is interesting because I asked specifically about Ashley Cole and and Pete Shuttleworth. We can presume that Mike Taylor will continue with the goalkeepers. But Ashley Cole and Pete Shuttleworth, obviously, you know, brought brought in at the same time as Wayne Rooney, survived, you know, Rooney sacking and stayed under Tony Mowbray. Ashley Cole, as actually we've spoken about on this podcast a couple of times, was empowered by, by Tony Mowbray and given a little bit more responsibility. And obviously that continued with Mark Venus when he was the, the interim head coach as well, interim manager, sorry. Um, but Rowett suggested that, um, you know, Less voices at this stage is probably a good thing. You know, there has been a lot, probably a lot of a lot of messages getting to these players from a lot of different voices over the course of this season. You know, you could probably we we must be into double figures in terms of coaches now, um, all in. So um, so Rowett has said their roles, referring to Shuttleworth and Cole, could change slightly across these eight games. He made made it clear that they'll still be important. Uh, behind the scenes, but he did say that their roles are likely to change over these next eight games. So it will be interesting to see, you know, if I can kind of gaze down into the into the dugout on a at, at Loftus Road on on Friday, whether Ashley Cole and Pete Shuttleworth are in the the dugout with Gary Rowett, Joe Carnell, uh, Dave Carroll, and Paul Robinson, Mike Taylor, and whoever, whoever else is in there. But but yeah, that's what he said. So we could probably expect a a uh, a slightly smaller clutch of coaches on the bench than we've been used to. Yeah, interesting point you made there because obviously we've everyone's spoken endlessly about the the number of managers that that Blues have had this season. But each manager has a has a, a lieutenant or an assistant, don't they? So mm-hmm. Keith Downing would have been critical at the start of the season. Yeah. Then with um, with Wayne Rooney, it was Pete Shuttleworth. Uh, it was Carl, Carl Rushworth, Robinson. wasn't it? Yeah. Carl Carl Robinson. Sorry. Uh, yeah, Carl Rushworth is the goalkeeper at Swansea, isn't he? Fucking goalkeeper. Yeah, he is a good goalkeeper. You probably don't want him when you go on your sideline <laughs> co- coaching about the press, though, do you? Yeah, Cole Robinson was uh, was was an, under Wayne Rooney. Then we've mm-hmm. obviously had Mark Venus with with Tony Mowbray, and and yeah. now it seems that Paul Robinson and, and Joe Carnell and Dave Carolan will, will be the um, the go to guys for 
Ferrara. I'm I'm interested in that, but because Joe, as you, as you said, was at, was at the club even before yeah. Gary Rowett got there, uh, and he was very much on the on the analysis side rather than the, the track suit on the grass kind of side of the operation. And Dave Carolan, when he was first there with Gary Rowett, was a strength and conditioning mm. sort of head of sports science role rather than a coaching of the football. And obviously, Paul Robinson, you, you know, will recognise him as, as as a younger coach, so he, he he's more involved in that. What that tells me is those three guys, Carol and um, Robinson and Carnell, it's all about getting a clarity of message over, isn't it? Mm. It's it's about getting that single, this is what we're doing for eight games message through to the players. Yeah, and I, th- I think the key thing there with, you know, Dave Carroll and Joe Carnell uh, and Paul Robinson as well to a, to a degree, they're obviously Rowett's lieutenants, aren't they? The messages are going to be coming from Rowett and obviously they're going to be trusted to impart some of them. But, you know, Rowett's voice is going to be the controlling one. I think that's been probably an issue since Mowbray stepped down is that there have been messages, but from, you know, various different voices. Um, So there's obviously now a clear figurehead in Gary Rowett and people working beneath him. One of the things I was actually going to ask you, Brian, because I think throughout this season, I've I've watched John Eustace's team train. I've watched Wayne Rooney's team train. And I was just kind of, Wondering whether you could give as much insight from your time previously covering Blues under Gary Rowett when you would have gone to pre-season camps as to how it worked with Gary Rowett in, in the middle of the training field. Yeah, so Gary Rowett w- was involved. He was, you know, he was he was a coach as much as he was a manager. Uh, he, he he would, you know, be there in his shorts or his tracksuit. He would introduce a session, stress the key learning points, and then he'd kind of retreat and let... Who was it now? Let me think. It would have been Kevin Summerfield to do the delivery. Mm. Kevin Summerfield and Mark Sale do, do the actual delivery of the session. And, and he'd then take a watching brief and maybe interrupt uh, and reinforce a point or, you know, pull somebody up if, the, if, if the, there was a standard that needed needed to be raised or something like that. So, yeah, he, he, he was pretty hands-on, um, not dissimilar to, to John Eustace, I think. Would you agree that that, that's, that was a sort of a... A Eustace trait, the way he ran his shop as well. Yeah, with Eustace, it was obviously always clear that he was in control. Sometimes he would relinquish that a little bit to Keith Downing, um, but mainly Eustace was the guy who would, you know, interject and stop sessions to get messages across. And uh, like you said, I'd imagine that's probably going to be the same with Gary Rowett. It feels like a very similar structure um, to the way, you know, Eustace worked, in that there's not going to be that many other coaches around him. I think one of the issues I probably had with Wayne Rooney's coaching stuff was that there's so many of them you know when I went down to training that one time there was there was people in like coaches Ashley Cole and John O'Shea in particular that day who who didn't actually do much with the players in that particular session you know they had about five or ten minutes of set piece coaching you know and Ashley Cole took that so John O'Shea was literally throwing balls for five minutes do you know what I mean so obviously they'd have done more behind the scenes but um when there's only going to be potentially um Rowett and three three guys really supporting him um, on the coaching field, then everyone knows where where the message is coming from. And, you know, it's, it's got to be one voice. I do think having one dominant voice is key. And uh, I think Blues have got that again now after not having that for, for the last six weeks. Yeah, clarity is absolutely vital. And and given the international, the few days off for the international break, yes, he's maybe not had all his chess pieces there that he, what he, he would have liked. But the players he has got, that clarity would have been met, would have been delivered in an abundance. I think yeah. so. Yeah, interesting from from that that side of thing. A couple of players he he hasn't worked with. I don't think any of the blue squad, other than Lukas Djukovic and Oli Burke. Um, obviously, yeah. we know Duke's injured. Um, I think Burke is. We now know that Burke is injured, don't isn't he? So what? So they're not necessarily going to be there to to be the, the the watching eyes on the pitch what is he what did he say about about Burke and Djukovic and their potential availability or lack thereof yeah Djukovic he I mean we know he went down a bit of a heap after that knee injury against uh against Watford in the last game before the international break um he said he wouldn't he hasn't given up on Djukovic playing again before the end of the season so he said he he, he hopes that he can feature in these final eight games at some stage but the the key thing that he said about Djokovic was that, you know, 
his, Djokovic's first message to him was, you know, I might not be able to play in these final late games, but I do want to be there. I want to be there for the squad. I want to travel with the squad. And again, that probably speaks volumes of as Djokovic of a, as a player and a man, a person as well. So, um, so yeah, he'll he'll even if he's not playing, he'll be around the squad and involved. Um, Oliver Burke hasn't played in over two months now. Pretty much frozen out by Tony Mowbray after that that Leicester game and um, in the cup. Um, didn't play under Mark Venus either. And uh, Gary Rout said he's been struggling with an injury. So uh, he's not expecting him to play a great deal of football between now and the end of the season either. Um, but yeah, Blues have got a fair... Injuries have crept up on them again recently. You know, they had a, a spell where they were virtually without injuries and um, having suffered quite a lot in the first three or four months of the season. But uh, but yeah, there's a fair few, isn't there, going into this game, this double double header against QPR and, um, and Preston. You know, the likes of Alex Pritchard, Dembele was struggling before the break. Bielik did train before the QPR game, so potentially he could play. Um, but yeah, just Burke, Burke, I'm not sure would have... But then again, actually, under route, maybe would have been an impact option and maybe would have played in some of the away games where Blues are going to have to counter-attack. But, um, but yeah, he won't be available. Djokovic won't be available for, for long spells of the remainder of this season. So um, it'll be interesting to see how Rowett finds alternatives to their physical attributes because Blues don't really have that many players like them. Yeah, uh, just on a note on Djokovic, it cannot end this way. Mm. You know, it, it cannot end. With him in a heap, uh, in the latter stages of a you know a really demoralising home home defeat to Watford. Mm. You now the guys played three hundred and twenty eight games for Blues, scored sixty seven goals. <sighs> you know let let's get safe and um, roll him out. If roll him out in the last five minutes of a meaningless uh, match on the last day of the season against Norwich, but just just don't let him limping off be the the the, the final the final sight of Lucas Djukovic in, in a Birmingham City shirt. No, that would be very sad. Um, Brian, you I know you predicted the team probably about a week ago now, looking at players kind of who were injured and players who were not going to be around during the international break. Um, are you still sticking with what you said? That team, <laughs> you can run people through it if you want. I, I, I to be fair, we, I, I will actually be on your side and say we did actually talk together before you put that team out and kind of ran across all the names and I was probably largely in agreement with you I think apart from we had a slight disagreement over Jordan James and and uh, Sung Ho Peck um, I probably think Peck might have the edge now given James exertions with Wales going 120 minutes in a penalty shootout so yeah but yeah go through the team and we'll uh, we'll choose some of the names about short answer is I can't remember it but um, what, I can. What, what, what I can <laughs> what I can remember is I think we we kicked around the idea of a, of a back three, then then decided that there wasn't enough centre back, authentic square mm. pegs in square holes centre backs to go with a back three. And uh, so I think we went with a four two three one, uh, which was obviously ready in goal, um, Ethan Laird at right back, Lee Buchanan at left back. So resisting the temptation to play him as a centre back when he, he's done okay, uh, to to be fair, but that's not really his 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 main main role um, and then I would have Dion Sanderson back in alongside I'd hoped Mark Roberts would be fit but it sounds he hasn't trained this week has he no, so yeah. it's it sounds as though it, Emmanuel Ivo is is the only other is the only other fit upright central defender so yeah Laird Sanderson Ivo Buchanan as the back four and then the I find that there's, there are constraints around around the, the the double pivot, the two deeper line midfielders, aren't there? Ivan Sunic is the one that leaps out on off, yeah, off the paper as, as as fit and available, mm. albeit with drawbacks around his distribution. And then it's a question of of who's the who's the next best option. Um, JJ, as you say, has just just played extra time with with Wales. Peck's mm. been across the other other side of the world. Andre Dizel isn't eligible because it's against his parent club. I think I went for JJ, didn't I? Um, mm. I just I don't see JJ being able to to, to turn that around. Um, no, I mean you, Bakuna potentially. Belik fit. I mean, if Belik is uh, seems to be pointing in the right direction, Belik is the player you drop in, isn't he? Well, that that is, and you know, we should probably mention that when we had Gary out on the podcast earlier this season, back in November. Um, 
he did point out how much he liked that Bielik and Sunic at midfield axis that Blues played at the start of the season, how he thought it gave them a really good platform to, to work from. So um, if Bielik is fit, and I know, I think Gary Wright said he only trained on the on Wednesday, so he could potentially have two days training. If Bielik is fit, um, I think we're probably going to see that that midfield at some stage of Sunic and Bielik reunited. It's the first time in a good while, that, wasn't it? I know they just yeah. played against Swansea in Mowbray's first game, didn't they? So, yeah, it'd be the first time in in almost three months they've played together. But um, that was that was a proper positive at the start of the season, the way those two played together. And they seemed to enjoy playing together. So I wouldn't be against that. Yeah, but Sunjic looked absolutely transformed, didn't he? You know, he'd, he'd been written off um, after, after after his stuttering Blues career, then, a, then a, an unhappy spell in, in Germany. And we all expected him to leave last summer. I, I think John Eustace even even asked asked us about uh, for for our impressions of, of Sunjic when we when we yeah. saw him in, um, uh, at the football writers do in in the summer, uh, and, and I managed to resist saying breaks of play for both teams. Um, but yeah, Eustace saw something in Sunjic that he liked, yeah. and I, I think we we know as as you as you said earlier from from. Rowett's appearance on our podcast. We know that Rowett likes the Belix on your axis as well. So, yeah, which brings us to the attacking three. Um, I've got a sneaky for George Hall. Mm. Um, I think Stansfield will play, uh, and I think it could well be on the left of the attacking three. Hall as the 10, which leaves, um, I suppose it leaves Tyler Roberts if Anderson's out and Dembele's out, and we wonder whether Rowett fancies. Um, Koji Miyoshi's approach, you know, lack of, lack of physicality, maybe. Yeah, I if, think if a three of Roberts, Tyler, and, and Stansfield is, is the way it'll go. The one, the one thing those three do give you in abundance is is you know mobility, speed. Um, Tyler Roberts, you know, he can can shift with the ball at his feet as well. Um, George Hall's probably the fastest attacking player other than Oliver Burke in this squad, so he's probably the the guy route is going to look to. If Blues are going to have to play on the transition. Um, and Stansfield, you know, he has to get in the eleven somewhere, doesn't he? So I, I actually prefer him in the three behind the striker. I think for too long now he's been kind of forced to play as the furthest play, player forward for Blues, and it's not really suited him. He's had to do it because others have been out of favour or have not done it well enough when they've been given the chance. Um, which brings us on to <laughs> everyone's fav- everyone's favourite whipping boy. Um, yeah. I mean, if you're playing Roberts and Stansfield in just behind the striker, and Djukovic isn't fit, and Oli Burke isn't fit, it leads us all to, all roads lead to a recall from Scott for Scott Hogan. Now, uh, I can hear people either switching off, or, they've turned off, mate. They've gone. They've gone. Or or, <laughs> or, or typing something rude in the comments, um, but. I, I just, I just think one thing that makes me think this is Rowett made reference to having worked for four or five days with a group of players. It would be, it wouldn't necessarily be fair or right to then go and reintroduce some, somebody else just returning. Mm-hmm. So I, I think he's going to pick the players he's been working with for four or five days, and the only striker he's got that he's been working with for four or five days is Scott Hogan. And I think if if Rowett can can whisper honeyed word into into his ears into his ear to to get get a couple of performances and a few goals out of him for the, for the final eight games, then that might be a nice way for Hogan to sign off too. I was going to say new contract then, Brian. If he gets a few goals, <laughs> <in the> final... <laughs> um, right? I might, yeah. I'm just I'm just about to type something rude in the comments myself. <laughs> now you've said that. Yeah, I'd I'd agree. To be fair, I, I mean. I, I don't think, you know, obviously Scott Hogan's not the answer long term for Blues, but he might be the answer in these final late games. You know, I think without Djukovic, Blues probably need a bit more of a focal point in their attack. Hogan can hold the ball and link up play. He wasn't, I don't think he was absolutely awful on his last start against Sheffield Wednesday, to be honest. I think they're probably worse performances that night. Um, and I think the key thing more than anything is that it, it 
unleashes Stansfield a little bit. You can't. I don't. I don't want to see Stansfield playing as a number nine with his back to goal in these final eight games. I want him to be playing slightly behind in a position where he's more comfortable and feels more free to to go and weave his magic. Um, you know, Stansfield's not a predatory striker. Is he? Some he's a fantastic striker of a ball, a fantastic finisher when he comes onto it from from a deep position. So. I'd like to see him there. I think obviously Blues have a lot of options in those positions behind the three strike behind the striker, um, but Hogan probably the only natural number nine available to route at the moment. And it would be, it would be probably you know slightly silly if 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 it was if he wasn't given a go. I suppose you know route might see something in training he doesn't like it and completely cast him aside. Um, but I, I think he'll probably get a go, especially as you as you said that route has worked with him four or five days. Um, and he is the only striker. So um, it'd be interesting on that basis of working with players four or five days, whether Stansfield starts, because obviously he's been away in 21s as well. Yeah. And and there's players like Gary Gardner um, mm. who who have been around. Ramel Donovan, who's kind of fallen off fallen off the cliff face a little bit, albeit still training with the with the first team. Uh, um, has, has Ramel been away with an age age group? I, I don't think so. I don't think so. I'll probably find out he has now, but I don't think so. Um, I think he's sensible what they've done with Ramel in the last few weeks in terms of putting him back down to the under 21s and letting him play football again because I think players like him can get lost when they're dragged into the first team, you know, after about two or three months of a season, kept there for three months. But when you look at the minutes they've played, it's not very many at all. You know, Ramel's probably not even played 100 first team minutes yet. Actually, he probably has. Probably just over. Um, but yeah, so you don't want him to to waste a season of his development, especially at this at this age. You know, just sitting sitting around waiting for a first team opportunity and travelling to first team games, but always being the 21st man. Yeah. Um, and also in a relegation battle, do you really really want to throw him into this situation now? Um, I know Wayne Rooney had real reservations back in November, December when Blues were on a poor run of form about putting Ramel Donovan into the into the eleven because I know he wanted to do it sooner than he did. Um so yeah, I think with Ramel it's probably a case of leaving him in the twenty ones to play football until the summer. Obviously he can still train with the first team as and when, but leaving him with the twenty ones to play football and then giving him another shot in the summer. Do you? I might I slightly disagree with that. I might be inclined yeah. to Stick him in the match day squad, knowing that the exuberance that he plays with, and, and mm. when he played with under Rooney, there was no fear, was there? There was mm. absolutely no res- no respect for for reputation or That's for the, the the stage. I wonder if fifteen minutes of Ramel off a bench might just give Blue something. But the the flip side of that is, as you say, I mean, what an expectation to to, to heap onto young shoulders. Be interesting to see which which way row it goes because. If you if we remember, Gary was not afraid of of getting a very young Dem- Demari Gray into yeah. his side, albeit you know Blues. Was, it, it was I think only twelve or thirteen games had gone when uh, mm. and the season was still in its infancy, and there wasn't quite as much hinging on every single performance and every and every moment of every game. Mm. Um, but yeah, interesting one. Alex, I'm going to let you go because I know you've got Loftus Road Stadium to get to tomorrow. Uh, Thank you very much for your time. Um, Thank you, everyone, for listening. Remember, hit subscribe, leave comments. Um, We're also available in a podcast format as well and whichever podcast outlet you use. So, Alex, thanks and thank you. And it's a keep right on. Thanks for listening.